number one. Number two, the Quran. Right? That should be pretty obvious. If one wants to increase their iman, then having an understanding of the Quran, reading the Quran, reflecting upon the Quran. You know, not just a superficial reading. And I wanted to give you somewhat of an example of what we mean by having kind of a, a deeper understanding of the Quran. There's a concept that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhan nas, O people, O mankind, antumul fuqara, all of you are impoverished, are in a state of poverty. Antumul fuqara, all of you are impoverished before Allah. Antumul fuqara illallah, all of you are impoverished before Allah. Wallahu huwa al ghaniyun hameen, and Allah is free of all needs, all wants, al ghani. Now, if you just did a casual translation of this ayah, oh yes, so, oh mankind, you are impoverished before Allah, and Allah is free of needs. Great. But if you really start to reflect upon this very ayah, and I'm just taking one ayah, and you reflect upon your life, your day, your age, the time you're living in, the people you're interacting with, it is extremely profound. Because the day and age we live in right now, it is extremely easy to forget that you are full of Allah, that you are impoverished before Allah. I want you to think about this for a second. You know, when some, when a person is in a state that they understand that they are absolutely dependent upon Allah, what do you think the state of this person's heart is? How do you think this person's iman is? Back, you know, like centuries ago, life was more precarious. When people needed to earn money, it wouldn't be like now where you get a job and you get a paycheck every two weeks. Because when that happens, you forget that you're impoverished for Allah. When you're thinking now, I have to make something, you know, sell something, to earn something, to come. So life was very precarious. You were kind of living almost day to day. And so your awareness of being impoverished for Allah was very acute. But now, fast forward to our day and age, right? I mean, we go, you can turn on the tap, take some water out, and drink, and drink some water. My brother, he mentioned, uh, he had the opportunity to study in, in Medina. And he said that there were people, students, that came from certain parts of Africa, that when they came to Medina to study, and when they saw the taps, and they opened the water, this was the first time they saw running water, they experienced running water. Because where they came from, they had to go out, walk, and collect water, you know? I'll tell you another interesting thing. When, when my parents shipped me off to Pakistan, um, I was a really rotten, spoiled American kid, right? And so there's a certain phenomenon that happens over there. And for the people that are from there, you might recognize it. It's called load shedding. Anyone know what this is? Wait. No. Load shedding? Yeah. It's where they basically just, they're just mean to you and they just take off electricity, right? I don't know, at the time I thought it was just for kids, but anyways. So you're in the, you're, you know, you imagine, you're sleeping, it's like 500 degrees outside, it's, it's hot here, right? And it's hot, and you've got the air conditioning in your room, and there the air conditioning are set, so they're per room, right? So you can blast it as, as, as you know, as, as cold as you want it. So your room's ice cold, you're under like five comforters, and it's, you know, 500 degrees outside. And all of a sudden, some dude in the electric company goes, crunch, and turns off electricity. And, and you know, and this happened, right? So I'm there. It's the middle of the night, like 2 o'clock in the morning, and I'm like, you got to be kidding me. This is ridiculous. I've never experienced this in America, right? So I'm like, you know what? I'm not going to do this. So check this out. I go outside. I get my dad's car keys. I get, go to the car. I start it. I crank up the air conditioning, and I go back to sleep. Okay? And like 10 minutes later, all of a sudden, I hear this banging on my window. And it's my dad, right? And mind you, he wasn't very happy when he saw me doing this, right? Like, get out of the car! What are you doing? My point with that was that I had been so used to having just air conditioning that I thought it was like, you know, it was, it was against human rights that I didn't have air conditioning, right? In other words, if you think about it, I was in this state of forgetting that I was impoverished before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? And the day and age that we're living in, it's so easy to forget. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, 
Indeed, the man, you know, the human being, he does tuqyan, he goes beyond the bounds. But why? Why does he go beyond the bounds? Why does he sin? In the next ayah, Allah says, Ara'ahu istaghna. Because he considers himself self-sufficient. In other words, he forgot that he is faqir before Allah, that he's, he's impoverished before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now this one ayah, you know, if you think about the time we live in, it has so much, it's so deep, and so applicable to us. And reading it, understanding it, also increases us in our mind. So the second thing that increases us in our mind, reading and pondering, reflecting upon the Quran. Number three. Now, knowledge of the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when I say knowledge, I don't mean like you hear like the term Ar-Razaq. Okay, he's the provider and he provides. Okay, that's that's interesting as a fact, but truly understanding the names and attributes. Let me give you an example. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions Surah al Hadith. He mentions four names and attributes. He says, Who will owe one, one after one God in one God? That he is the first and the, the last. last, and we'll translate it that he is a law in a law. Literally, if you want to translate it, law in is that which is apparent, law in is that which is hidden. But the Prophet has a dua in which he expounds upon these names. And he says, Oh Allah, you are an Awad, and there's nothing before you. Now stop. Most Muslims worship Allah, understanding that Allah is an Awad. In other words, that there's nothing that preceded him, nothing that preceded our creation. In other words, we understand Allah is an Awad, and we worship Allah based upon this. But to worship Allah with His name Al-Akhir, as the Prophet said, Oh Allah, you are Al-Akhir and there's nothing after you. This is where the challenge comes in. Why? What do we mean by Allah is Al-Akhir? You see, here's the thing. When you realize that the end is Allah, and you start to implement this, and you try to implement this, what realization you're coming to is that there is nothing after Allah. There is no aim outside of Allah. And all of your motivation, everything that you do is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's nothing that comes after that. And this sort of state, few of us, unfortunately, worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with this in mind. In other words, every single inclination of the heart, every intention, every action, everything that you do, every aim you realize has no benefit unless it is done for Allah. Think about that for a second. That He is an Akhir and there's nothing after Him. Let me give you somewhat of a, a practical example. You know, um, sometimes, if you're ever in a, in a job interview, right, and this happened to me as well, and let's say that, the, that you're doing the job interview, and, and by the way, I'm not taking the opinion here of the difference of opinion in terms of shaking hands. I'm going to take the opinion that you're not supposed to shake hands with the opposite gender, okay? Point being, Assuming that you have that opinion, when you're in that job and someone of the opposite gender walks in and they say, Hi, my name is Cindy. What goes through your mind? Think about it. Man, if I don't shake her hand, she'll think I'm some sort of weirdo and I might not get the job. Right? Yeah? Which is natural. Like I said, it's, it's, it's fine. It's natural. It's not fine, but it's natural. Now, if a person has this idea that Allah is an akhir, there's nothing after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The person's heart should be in the state that indeed all of my permission comes from Allah. It doesn't come from this person who's extending their hand out to me. This is a different spiritual state than just worshiping Allah as an open. Do you understand the difference? When you understand that Allah is an akhir, there's nothing after him, no motivation after him, everything is done for Allah, then the mindset, or maybe I should say the heart set, is such that it doesn't depend on my shaking the hand or not, but it depends on the one that created this job, the one that brought this being into being, the one that put me in this earth, and so on and so forth. It's two different mindsets. Do you understand? So this has a higher state. Now, um, 
You know, sometimes people have this idea of going out to happy hour. Right? That's another example. And the first year that I started working, um, I didn't really know what that was, believe it or not. And so I went out and I was like, wait a minute, this is a bar. <laughs> and so I called my wife and she said, you need to leave now, right? But again, but at that point, I have to be really honest. I was struggling spiritually. Because I was like, wait a minute, like, what are they going to think of me? I just got this job. And if I leave now, what are they going to think of me? Maybe I should just order some apple juice and pretend to drink. Right? Alhamdulillah, I didn't do that. I just walked out. <laughs> but you get the point. Worshiping Allah by His name al-Afid and understanding what that means. So there's a difference between mental recognition and spiritual reality. And that's what we're talking about. A spiritual state versus mental recognition. And that's what we're talking about when it comes to the names and attributes of Allah. Not just, this is the name of Allah and this is the attribute of Allah. But what does that truly mean for us and our spiritual state and our spiritual connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So the third thing, we said number one was what? Beneficial knowledge. Okay, one person paying attention. I did that. <laughs> I should offer a prize to people, right? I should have like an iPad or something. Like, Free iPad, you know? Everyone's like all of a sudden taking notes. All right, number one, beneficial knowledge. Number two, how else do you raise your iman? From the sisters, what's number two? <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> number two, what was the second way we said? For God. Sorry? Quran, exactly. Okay, number three, brothers, I'll give you a chance. Not you. <laughs> number three. Quran was number two. Dua, dua was number one. The dua of the Prophet that was number one. The names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? That's number three. I think I'll give you maybe... I'll give you two more. How about that? And then we'll stop. I'll, give, I'll try to be quick. Number four. Reflecting upon the sida of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The sida of the Prophet The life story of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sit down. Inshallah, we can at least hear it from you guys, right? Uh, reflecting upon the seed of the Prophet, alayhi salatu wa salam. You know, I'll tell you something from my experience. I, I, I kind of, I, one of the areas that I specialize in is da'wah, right, to non-Muslims. And you'll be shocked, you know, if you take non-Muslims through the seed of the Prophet, salam, it has a profound effect on them. Just, I'm not talking about the entire seed, I thought, obviously, you can't take them. You know, it's gonna, it'll take you a long time. Muslims have gone through the entire scene, right? I'm saying even just tidbits out of it. Just little, just little tidbits out of it. Let me give you an example, okay? And I want you to think about this. Do you remember, you know, there was an incident in the life of the Prophet, والسلام, that he had an issue with his, with his wives. And Umar ibn Khattab, you know, he was very worried about the Prophet, والسلام. the Prophet والسلام, had, had gone to his house, and gone to his room, and kind of, he wasn't really seeing anyone. And Umar ibn Khattab goes to the room or goes to the house of the Prophet and he asks permission to go in and the person that was sitting outside goes in and, and asks the Prophet and the Prophet initially said he doesn't want to speak to anyone. And this is Umar ibn Khattab, right? He's kind of his right hand man after Abu Bakr. So then he asks again and again he's denied. But the third time, the Prophet lets him in. And Umar ibn Khattab, if you remember, when he walks in, he tries to light the moon. And he says, Ya Rasulullah, when we were in Mecca, the women there, they were obedient, they listened to us, they did what we wanted them to do. But here in Medina, they actually have, you know, in contemporary terms, they have an attitude, right? I'm like, I'm not taking that, right? And the Prophet says, I'm smiled. But guess what? Umar looks around at the living quarters of the Prophet And what does he see? He sees just a straw mat. And he sees like this container in, in the corner, like this, this simple jug of a container. And when he's looking at this, he starts crying, and tears come to his eyes. And you know, he's just he's looking around. And now the Prophet وسلم, says, Oh, Allah, what is making you cry? Why are you crying? And Umar al Khattab says, Ya Rasulullah, the kings of the Byzantine Empire, they have their thrones, and they have their servants, and they have their palaces, and the kings of Persia are living in their luxury with their jewels and their palaces and all of this, and you, you are the messenger of Allah, and you live like this? You live like this? And the Prophet says, Oh Umar, this is what this is what's causing you to cry. Oh Umar, they have what they have in this dunya. But for me, 
I have it in the Akhirah. SubhanAllah. You know, this one incident showing the simplicity of the greatest human being to walk the face of this earth. The truthfulness of the Prophet is exemplified when you look at stories like this. You know, sometimes people ask, like, how do you, to a non-Muslim, how do you show that the Prophet was truly the Messenger of Allah? Right? And this is kind of a construct that they come up with. So they say that, look, if someone claims to be a Prophet, there's only three options. This is known as a deductive argument. Three options. Either he was telling the truth, or he was lying, or he was deceived. Right? Is there a fourth option? There isn't, just letting you know. But anyone else want to try? Besides the There's no other option, right? Just think about it for a while. So, if that's the case, then if you can disprove two options, by logical necessity, you only have one that you told the truth. And take any example you want from the Sita, and you can show it. I'll tell you my favorite. You remember when the son of the Prophet whose name was Ibrahim, when he died, what happened on that night? Who knows? What happened? Kosuf, exactly. There was an eclipse, right? And what did the people say? The people started to come around and said, there's an eclipse. And so now, the sun and the moon, they're eclipsing because the sun of the Prophet died. This is what they were saying. Now, the Prophet ﷺ comes out, and what does he say? Well, first of all, if he was a liar, you think he'd definitely take advantage of that opportunity. He would come out and say, yes, indeed, my son died, and therefore the sun and the moon eclipsed. Or, if he was delivered,